Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Isela Carbonell. I am the curator at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida, and I am delighted to have you with me this morning to um, have a look at our exhibition, Marcus Jansen e Pluribus Uno. We're gonna be taking a tour uh, around the galleries and looking at uh, some of the works that are in the exhibition that I think are emblematic of the themes that Marcus addresses in his artistic practice in general, but specifically in the selection of works that um, he chose for this exhibition. So, um, uh, to give you a little bit of background, and I'm so happy that you're joining me uh, today. If you have questions or comments uh, during uh, the talk, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, I may address them while uh, uh, we're talking, uh, I'm talking about the work or at the end. So feel free to put in your questions and comments. Um, I'll give you more information about the exhibition and um, where and how you can see it if you haven't seen it yet. Um, but I want to start by um, acknowledging the importance of this exhibition um, and in the context of the uh, election season that is still ongoing. Um, and the reason why we planned it to be on view um, in the fall of 2020. So uh, this is an exhibition that we have been working on for uh, two years uh, before it opened. And with the pandemic, we thought about, should we postpone it? Should we still have it on view as 2020? And we decided to go with um, the program and the exhibition as scheduled, uh, because particularly because of the topics that uh, Marcus addresses and the things that we wanted to have um, on view, the opportunity to have these dialogue um, at this particular time of the year. So uh, I, I wanna share a little bit about Marcus's story. If you're not familiar with, with his work, the image that I'm showing here is the entrance to the exhibition. I'll talk about that work on the right in a second, but I wanna tell you a little bit about um, Marcus's story and how um, he became an artist and why he's interested in themes such as power structures, hierarchies, surveillance, um, those work, those themes that are um, present in his work. Um, so Marcus was born in 1968 in New York, in the uh, Bronx. Uh, he was born to a Jamaican mother and a German father. Um, he exhibited his first work of art when he was six years old. Uh, he submitted to an arts competition and exhibited a work. And like most kids was interested in art making. But um, as a young uh, boy, his family moved to Germany and uh, there he faced, of course, many challenges. He had to go to school in German, so he switched to living his life um, in his, what was until then his second language. He was the only black kid in his school, the only black kid in his neighborhood. Um, so there he had to learn to overcome challenges that were presented to him because of his circumstances. Um, and those skills that he learned early in his life would become crucial and helpful for him later um, once he comes back from Germany, um, goes back to New York with his family again. Um, and this is a time in the 80s when, uh, of course, the graffiti movement in New York City is booming, the hip hop movement. And as a young man, and you see him there on the left um, uh, in this photograph from 1987, as a young man uh, interested in uh, the graffiti movement and the art scene that is so tied to the urban environment and to life in the city, the subways, um, uh, the young men and women who are creating art and selling it on the streets. So he starts creating smaller works of art and selling them on Prince Street with others and creating community with these other artists who are um, also absorbing the atmosphere and the environment of the city and um, having that inform uh, their works. Um, but then he joins the U.S. Army and uh, 
as a member of the U.S. Armed Forces, of course, he is deployed to uh, Desert, Desert Storm. Uh, he goes to many different parts of the world, combat zones and uh, U.S. military bases in other countries. You see him here in that photograph in the center from August of 1990 uh, wearing the uniform. This experience will uh, change his life, of course, in many different ways and also will become crucial and key for his artistic development. His experience in the military um, in two in two main ways. One, uh, because he is now part of a structure uh, that um, it will become uh, an important framework for him to think about how we operate in the world and how the military operates and how he as an individual was part of this larger structure and the way that that has in society. Um, not only in, in military um, aspects, but also in personal and civilian life. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we look at some of the um, paintings that are examples of this. Um, and also it will be key in his development as an artist uh, because it is in the mil military that he experiences um, how combat and how war changes the landscapes, change the landscape and changes uh, the individuals who inhabit those places, and changes the way that we perceive each other. Um, for him, and he talks about how flying over combat zones in a helicopter and looking down and seeing the destruction on the ground and the landscape change the way that he uh, sees things and thinks about these things. Um, and war, the experience of war from up above, from a helicopter doing, looking down, as well as from the ground and his experience being there, um, are experiences that would st stay with him for the rest of his life. He's now in his early 50s. You can see him there on the picture on the right. Um, and these experiences in the military endure for him and inform a lot of the work that, that he does now as an artist. Um, I asked him about um, war and conflict and the presence of war so vividly in his work. And this is what he said. I'll read this quote for you. This is um, included in the exhibition catalog, which you can get at the museum. He says, quote, warfare, whether military, economic or psychological, is a means to exercise power and exists within humanity all the time without our being fully aware of it. Painting is always a visual, mental, and intellectual combat to me, uh, an exercise that could lead to closure. Um, and so uh, it's interesting when he talks about closure because uh, it's a way for him to process this experience, but it's also a way for him to revisit it and reconfigure it and reimagine it in his artwork. Uh, Marcus developed PTSD, um, so he had to leave the military um, he received treatment through an art, ther art therapy program at Walter Reed, um, which was also key in his development as an artist. And it was that experience that led him to uh, become a full-time artist and devote himself to art making um, and perfect his skills and develop a body of work that is um, compelling and um, of the moment that um, speaks about his personal experience, but also um, about war and conflict and politics in general. And so we talked about the title, E Pluribus Unum, uh, which we chose for the exhibition in this framework and thinking of all of his experiences and how he looks at the world today. And Marcus is an artist who is um, informed by uh, history. He looks at history, but he's also very in tune with what's happening in the now. And so when thinking about E Pluribus Unum, and I have here an image that um, shows the, the, uh, this motto, even though it's not the official motto of the US, but was included officially in the seal of the United States in 1782, uh, this motto, um, E Pluribus Unum, out of many one. And I had many conversations with Marcus when we were selecting um, a possible title for the exhibition uh, a, a phrase that, of course, talks about how out of many, the union of many colonies, one nation is born. 
but that the meaning perhaps of that um, statement um, is different today, um, is different in our current context. When we think about um, e pluribus unum or out of many one, um, some interpret it as, as a way to emphasize uh, exceptionalism, right? Out of many other nations, the uniqueness of this one in particular. And Marcus has played with this idea in some of the works that um, he creates, um, especially the painting titled E Pluribus Unum from 2008, um, which I don't, uh, I'm not going to talk about in super detail, but I wanted to mention it's one of the first paintings you see when you walk into the exhibition. And it's the one that we use as we started this collaboration for this project to think about as a possible way to title uh, to title the show. This was a commission that Marcus received from Warner Brothers um, uh, to illustrate or interpret The Wizard of Oz. Um, and so this is the, the interpretation that he created uh, is a painting with some collaged elements. Um, and uh, I'm including some close-up details there on the right that uh, show you perhaps some of the metaphors that he is using from the film, from the story of The Wizard of Oz to um, perhaps make a commentary about the history of the United States as a nation and the political history in particular. You see allusions to the American flag, uh, to the White House, to the uh, stereotypical figures um, of uh, politicians of times uh, past. Um, and so I like that one of the things that draws me to his work, um, and I think you'll see that um, as you move through the exhibition and look at the different works, is that Marcus very seamlessly brings together references to history, references often to uh, popular culture, um, and politics. Um, and so with these bright colors and very expressive uh, way of uh, painting and uh, representing uh, these very gestural um, uh, and bold uh, depictions of recognizable tropes and, and images, he grabs the viewer. I feel like he grabs our attention and then he kind of holds those there. He doesn't give us the answers, right? So if you're looking at these image and trying to make sense of it and trying to uh, decipher the meaning of every single thing in the work, uh, perhaps you find yourself struggling and trying to uh, to find, okay, well, what does it mean, right? And he, he's very reluctant to provide statements that would give away the meaning of a particular work, because I think one of the interesting things about this particular um, work, and in the case of Marcus as an artist, is that he wants to engage the viewer only to that point where the viewer can start um, reading and interpreting by him or herself, right? That we all bring our own ideas and our own experiences to the reading of a work as complex and as nuanced as Marcus's. And so I think we can see that throughout. Um, the exhibition. I'll talk about uh, this example because it relates to, well, for several several reasons. One, because it's it's the one work in the exhibition that we acquired for our permanent collection. So once the exhibition closes on January 3rd, this work will remain as part of our collection. I'm referring uh, to plot number two from 2018, this uh, piece that appears here on the right. So you see her, you see it there in the context of the show in the photograph on the left. Um, and this relates to um, some of the experiences that Marcus had as part of the military and in his years in the military. He talks about um, the first time that he experienced or really thought about surveillance in 1993. He was deployed in the DMZ zone between North and South Korea. Um, and there he saw for the first time a military drone. And he said that he talks about how that encounter with these uh, military surveillance drones that had uh, incredible capability uh, and that look, look almost like jets, right? On man, uh, small or medium airplanes that have a lot of different capabilities for su surveillance in military conflict. Um, and he was in awe of, of the military uh, surveillance drone when he encountered it. It's something that stayed with him 
to the point where years later, um, he traveled uh, in one of his trips to London. He started seeing all these cameras around the city. And um, as one of the most surveilled cities in the world, uh, that experience sort of resonated with him. And he started thinking about, okay, in the military, I can sort of see the use of these surveillance drones for military operations or in moments of, of um, combat or um, to surveil um, an adversary. But what about these cameras all over the city, right, to surveil civilians? And so he started thinking about the ways in which um, surveillance has been used historically in different contexts. So here you have him uh, kind of connecting his personal experience with history and with current events or current experiences. Um, these um, works from 2018, the one on the left um, is uh, phone infiltrations and the one on the right is plot number two. So uh, he started researching when was wiretapping first used by the government as a way of um, surveillance um, used by law enforcement, not by the military, but by law enforce enforcement and government agencies. And so that took him to the early 20th century. Um, and so in doing that research and reading about um, wiretapping, for instance, started painting a series and the painting on the left depicts an antique um, early 20th century candlestick telephone, which becomes a sort of ruinous um, uh, structure, almost architectural in the size that it occupies most of the canvas. And then on the right in our piece, plot number two, the representation of a uh, an antique obsolete, may we say, um, typewriter that also becomes um, perhaps a portrait uh, to this object that signifies and symbolizes um, surveillance on the one hand, but also censorship, right, of whatever is typed um, and produced in that uh, in that typewriter. And you can see towards the bottom a very small figure entering uh, the landscape. So it's almost a conflation of the experience of landscape as we were talking about in the beginning with his memory of seeing uh, landscapes that were uh, partially destroyed or destroyed, um, thinking about surveillance, thinking about freedom of speech. Um, and what can be typed, what can become propaganda, what can become perhaps a report on the truth, right? Um, he thinks a lot and questions a lot the use of information um, and the media. And um, here we have, uh, as we move through this gallery, uh, one of the large canvases uh, that addresses this topic. This one is uh, titled Circuit Break from 2013. Um, and you see a detail here of some of the figures that appear in this painting. And one of the things, and, and let me know what you think as you look at these works and think about them with me. Um, feel free to enter your comments in the chat or your questions. But one of the things that I um, enjoyed so much in, in studying Marcus's work and thinking about it is how clever he is titling some of the, some of the works. Uh, there's a, a, a play here with irony in some of them. Um, and uh, sometimes with language that may seem contradictory or that uh, seems playful, um, but adds another layer uh, to the unpacking of the meaning and the nuance of these works. So circuit break is, um, is a, an image that presents this horizontal composition. It's monumental, it's large, um, it presents almost a tableau. It adds to envision ourselves immersed in this uh, landscape, immersed in this scene. We, we're not sure what it is, but the title gives us some clues. Uh, some clues. Um, and I did ask him specifically about this painting. And he said, well, for me, it's almost trying to think about what it would look like or what it would feel like to be inside a computer modem. <clears throat> Excuse me, inside this technological, technical structure that transmits data, that transmits information. And in thinking about that, of course, thinking about, well, who controls the transmission of information? Who controls what information is transmitted and when? And so 
these are the structures that sort of uh, turn the wheels of our life as part of a society that we don't really see. And I bet you, like I do, we use the internet all the time on our phones, on our tablets, at work. Um, and yet we don't necessarily stop to think, how is this information coming to my screen, right? It just does. Um, and so in thinking about that, um, Marcus is questioning who are the powerful um, figures or institutions or entities that make that transmission of information possible? When and how? What are the criteria? How is that criteria established? So it's almost a behind the scenes um, look at um, how he would envision that, how he visualizes that. And I think there's something so powerful about these works is because in his vision and his interpretation, we can see our own, right? It's almost playful when we look at some of these figures, they're holding some of the cables and the wires. Um, some of them look like they're holding um, lights, perhaps illuminating that kind of chaotic um, landscapes. And then you see some of the wires are broken. You see the exposed um, internal wires uh, coming out of the cables and, um, and kind of just being there, right? So I wonder if, if communication was interrupted at one time or another. Um, this idea of power, the notion of power is recurrent um, in his work. It's in pretty much all of the works that we selected for this exhibition. There is the presence of power, whether overtly or perhaps um, as an idea or as a concept that is um, the foundation for some of the images that he depicts. And so I'm including here um, some of the works on paper um, that we included in the show um, that address um, this idea of power from a different perspective also. Um, and I wanted to say that in terms of his process, um, these works on paper are not sketches. These are finalized works. Uh, Marcus really doesn't sketch when he works. Um, he works usually having four or five canvases laid out, blank canvases laid out in his studio. And then he goes from one to the other, um, back and forth working simultaneously in several paintings at the same time. So he's not the traditional artist who would sketch first and then um, paint or create the big paintings. So these works on paper, even though they're on paper and they're small, they're not sketches. They are finished paintings that are as beautiful as the large canvases. And if you go to the museum, I invite you to spend some time with each of them. Uh, they are beautiful, um, beautiful colors and executed beautifully. And the titles are also um, interesting signals to some of the references that he brings to these works. So in talking about power, and then in this particular case, I'm highlighting here the, um, the work that is on the wall on the lower left of this arrangement um, of the works on paper. There are references here to a book that you may be familiar with that I would invite you to reread if you read it a long time ago, maybe when you were in school, um, George Orwell's 1984 which I read recently. I actually read it the weekend before the election. That was my pre-election reading. Um, and I had read parts of it years ago when I was a student, and it was just so eye-opening to read it again in this context and to think about Marcus's work while reading it. So I'm just gonna quote very briefly here from the book and how, uh, because this, there are many references to Orwell's um, 1984 and many other of uh, Marcus's works. But especially where there's this um, uh, part of the book where the author, uh, uh, they talk about power here. And they say, quote, we are not interested in the good of others. We are interested solely in power. Power is not a means. It is an end. The object of power is power. And I thought that was so fascinating because uh, Marcus, as I said, he goes back and looks at historical references. And some of these things that he reads come back um, or make appearances in his work. And it's the case, that is the case with this one in particular, The Brotherhood from 2017. Um, the Brotherhood, uh, of course, is an important um, uh, institution, so to speak, but also an idea that comes, has a, an important part 
um, in the book, and it says, quote, the Brotherhood cannot be wiped out because it is not an organization in the ordinary sense. Uh, nothing holds it together except an idea which is indestructible, um, end of quote. But also this idea of brotherhood has a, perhaps a different meaning for someone who served in the military, um, has a different meaning when we think about how we relate to others. But the reference to, uh, to Orwell's text here is interesting when we look at, at this image um, that may have some traces that, um, visual traces perhaps to this idea of of Big Brother in the book, always watching, always surveilling, always knowing the movements of civilians in this, um, in this society. And so this idea of, of uh, truth, what is truth, how we perceive uh, information as it comes to us, uh, this idea, this notion of ideas that are indestructible um, or the appearance that they are indestructible, um, uh, comes through in a work like this one, Obscure Line Between Fact and Fiction, a work from 2018 that, um, that I'm sorry, uh, from 2010, which um, is as timely perhaps today. So I wonder what you think about when you look at a work like this um, and feel free to submit your, your reactions or comments in the chat. But uh, this is a large scale work. I think I have a picture of it. In the gallery, you can see it here on the left, uh, is a monumental piece that um, uh, goes back to that idea of his experience, uh, Marcus's experience of and memory of combat zones and how he reworks that, that memory um, and transforms it into something that can be read in two very different ways. Um, to me, this is a work that could be read perhaps as a, um, uh, a site of destruction, a site of um, hopelessness, a site of uh, post, maybe post-war um, scene. Um, some have said maybe it's a kind of post-apocalyptic depiction, or it can be read in a very uh, in the very opposite way of saying, well, yeah, there is some destruction and chaos that can be read into this image, um, but he's also giving us here some glimmers of hope, right? That we see if you look on the right, to the right of this semi-dilapidated structure, there is that beautiful, um, that beautiful, uh, uh, beautifully rendered uh, blue butterfly. Uh, on the left, there is a pink, uh, <laughs> Deer, so these fantastical elements that um, come also and make their appearance, um, and uh, and also these kind of diagonal uh, line that opens up the night sky uh, to bring uh, a ray of light, of brightness, of perhaps truth. So the title again, when we think about obscure line between fact and fiction. The line here is not that obscure, right? So it's a play on words in terms of how we read it and how we interpret it, how we interpret it. Um, and uh, yes, Anna, I see your comment here. I think I agree. Um, she's saying, considering its date, it, uh, the work is present while at the same time reminding us of the cyclical nature of history. Absolutely, here we are in 2020, 10 years later, um, having to think about the difference between fact and fiction and dealing with it pretty much every day. Um, having uh, technological advances like uh, social media, which has become uh, a normal part of our daily life, having to question if what we see every day is fact or is fiction. Um, and same way in terms of, and going back to Orwell's 1984, if what we perceive right, as civilians, as members of society, is that fact or fiction? Uh, what does the military perceive or is presented as fact or fiction? And these are all things that I'm sure uh, Marcus is, is working through um, as he is, uh, as he is uh, painting these kinds of, of scenes. And of course, when we talk about um, power, and power structures, and uh, going back to that quote about the object of power is power. Um, and this is a theme I think that, that Marcus deals with 
um, in such an effective way. Um, I'm showing you here uh, two large scale portraits, um, part of Marcus's faceless series in the back of this gallery, uh, right next to uh, obscure line between fact and fiction. These are uh, revolutionary elites on the left and artists, the new founding father on the right. And, and notice that revolutionary is in quotes in that title. And that's, that's the way that Marcus uh, wants the title to appear, revolutionary in quote, elites. Again, the contradictions, right? And the, uh, the shift in paradigm from one word to the next is also the shift in paradigm that we, that we identify or can see when we explore and study these works in detail. Um, revolutionary elites and art as the new founding father, I think are two of the most effective works in this exhibition that um, perhaps uh, subvert the tradition of portraiture and subvert the tradition of um, art historical representation uh, and create something that is a little bit difficult to decipher. And I think that is one of the points uh, that the artist tries to make. Again, he's not giving us the answer. He's drawing us in, uh, asking questions, and then kind of setting the stage for us to interpret. Um, so instead of seeing here the traditional figures that we see in classical portraiture, think about um, 18th, 19th century European or American uh, portrait paintings, these large scale images uh, commissioned by those who are in power, who have the means to commission an artist to paint their portraits that would um, endure for generations to come and um, show <clears throat> their power and wealth and uh, authority and legacy are here turned into these figures that are at the same time comical um, and perhaps um, unsettling. Uh, they're a little bit strange. So we see in revolutionary elites, the traditional pose with the formal attire, holding different um, items or attributes that would speak to the power and health and wealth of the person depicted. But then the face of the figure has become uh, blurred. Uh, again, this is part of, of the Faceless series um, where we can't really see uh, who specifically is being portrayed. So it becomes almost like a, um, a, a stereotypical uh, traditional portrait that now has become something else. On the right, Art is the New Founding Father, um, I think is perhaps a commentary about how these power structures uh, that um, Marcus works with are not only present in um, the military or politics or the government, but they're also present in the art world, right? And that's something that we sometimes don't talk about enough or artists sometimes don't address enough. But here we have that figure again, dressed formally, but his face, her face or his face here, has been turned into this um, almost blinding fluorescent light almost or re reflection. Uh, the mouth and the nose almost look like clownish. Um, if you notice the, uh, the shirt or uh, underneath the, the big coat, just polka dog, black and red. Um, so there's al almost uh, a sense of something that is uh, funny, that is not as um, uh, powerful or that doesn't have as much authority, um, but it's still there presiding over this large painting. And in the background, if you notice the, um, the words, the letters that Marcus has included there, S on the left and then on the right, O-L-D, so sold, um, and then in the foreground, art, so perhaps alluding to auction houses, or maybe galleries. Although if you look at the right side, OLD, old, perhaps making a reference to old modes of representation, um, old school ways of portraying these figures. Um, and one thing that uh, Marcus shared with me when we were thinking about how to display um, this is, I'll share a little bit of the behind the scenes with you. Um, but one of the things that Marcus um, and I talked about and he shared with me when 
we were looking at the space and thinking about how do we um, lay out the gallery, right? Where do we have these two figures? Do we have them both together? Do we um, hang them in different walls? Um, and, he, and he said that for him, thinking about the gallery space was thinking about um, a battlefield. Um, and, and he said, you know, if we have these landscapes like obscure line between fact and fiction that we talked about earlier, that shows this kind of uh, destruction and uh, scenes that lack uh, stability and coherence um, and clarity, then we need to have these figures overseeing that um, and thinking about ways in which the powerful, the wealthy, um, uh, these, these almighty <laughs> figures have been involved in um, events that have caused such uh, chaos and destruction. And so he's seeing the relationships and putting um, two and two together, so to speak, right? So these figures sort of preside over these scenes all around the gallery. Um, and, um, and I like how, he, uh, how he's thinking about that, going back to that um, famous quote he gave in an interview where he says, for me, painting is the most intimate act of war. And so these figures are there um, sort of presiding and overseeing all of this, um, but um, they are at a point where their authority is diminished, is questioned, right? Um, so going back to that idea of the, the cycles of history um, repeating, and there is one work um, in the exhibition called History Repeats, um, it is true, yes, they repeat, but the way that Marcus is perhaps tackling that is seeing how in each cycle, there's a way to subvert, there's a way to undermine, there's a way to uh, perhaps interpret in a different, um, in a different way. Um, I have a comment here about this cube reality is the manipulation of scale. Absolutely. For example, the size of the figure compared to the size of the deer or butterfly is startling and alluring. I like that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, you're referring to uh, the size of the figure in the foreground there and um, in comparison with the animals in comparison with the structure. Absolutely. I agree. These two, which are on the opposite side of revolutionary elites and um, artist the new founding father, are two works that I think uh, round that idea <laughs> that we were talking about with the other two portraits. Here we have the general in his sales pitch from 2014 and the little emperor from 2013. These are two um, images I think that are excellent examples of how Marcus um, grabs us and um, holds our interest and our attention and almost uh, playing a game of trying to decipher what it is that we are seeing. I feel like each time I look at these paintings, which I, I find fascinating, but I feel like every time I look at them, I have to adjust my sight to kind of make sense of what I'm seeing. Um, in the general and his sales pitch, I was talking to a group of students um, the other day and we were thinking, well, I always look at this image and think of generals are um, as male figures first, right? So here we have a general with his um, jacket and his tie with all his medals and ribbons, someone who has been um, highly recognized, of course. Um, but someone who's also sort of disintegrating. If you look at the lower edge of the painting, um, Marcus has let the paint drip where his hands are resting. Um, so it, it, the figure is kind of disintegrating, is dripping, is not as solid as we usually think of a general, right? Um, and then in the top part of the painting, the head of this figure has transformed into I don't know, tell me what you think this is, because for me, I read it in, in several ways. I, uh, I think of um, 
maybe a bouquet of flowers, the combination of colors and the delicate brushwork and beautiful um, forms in the in the head of the figure to me um, it remind me or evoke perhaps a, something that is traditionally associated with femininity, um, with something delicate, maybe again, a bouquet of flowers. Sometimes I think of cotton candy. Um, a student the other day said, well, they look like macaroons, right? With all the different bright colors um, there. Um, and then we look at the title, the general and his sales pitch. What is it, what is the general sales pitch when we think about, um, yeah, maybe ice cream, absolutely. Um, why, what is the sales pitch for a military general, right? So it's sort of the conflation of, of different aspects of society that are here together. Um, and again, it's interesting to think that a painting like this is made by someone who was in the military and sort of thinking about these figures having a lot of authority and power in one realm of their life and of society, but perhaps not as much in others, right? So sort of the fluidity of how the leadership and authority is displayed um, and how it is asserted. Um, the one on the right, perhaps, may be, um, yes, Laura, thank you, colorful language to sell an idea, absolutely. And to, and again, going back to this idea of factor fiction, right? To get um, people to buy into it or to accept it as truth and to support it. Um, and we can make uh, parallels absolutely with, with our contemporary times. Uh, the Little Emperor on the right, um, which is also one of my favorites, I know they're all my favorites, but um, I think it's such a successful painting um, and effective in conveying this, these ideas. When we think about emperors, we think about figures who are larger than life, even if they're small in physical stature, uh, they own and command, uh, they own land, they command armies, they um, have authority and power over others. Um, and yet here um, we see the emperor is so small, he doesn't even fill the entire canvas. And these are conscious decisions that Marcus is making, right, to make the point. Um, his um, uniform is incomplete. The pieces that are missing have the shape of um, jigsaw puzzles, so references to, uh, to children or to childish or games or um, toys. And then the head here is covered by a shape that is reminiscent of Mickey Mouse, the ears of Mickey Mouse. So maybe a, a commentary if on the one, um, edge of the gallery, we had a commentary on power structures and hierarchies in the art world. I think here, in addition to the military and the government and political history, um, there is a commentary here about consumer culture, right? Um, and how, you know, this the, the idea of Mickey Mouse is, is present, um, perhaps an allusion to how uh, the public, you know, consumes things that are presented to them as necessary, as desirable, um, and they exert power over us as consumers, right? So these are the little emperors that lived in popular culture and in consumer culture. Um, and I think also there's a commentary about how obsolete some of these formulas are in looking at the uniforms of these figures, um, the incompleteness, their um, their state of maybe disintegrating or diluting, or perhaps he's presenting to us the possibility to think about the possibility of these figures transforming into something else, right? I have some comments here about the general and his sales pitch. Uh, you vote for macaroons, showy, but no substance. Absolutely. That's how I feel about the cotton candy too. So big and colorful, and yet there's, there's really nothing there. Excellent. And so to end our tour today, um, I wanted to end with Marcus's self-portrait. Um, and you see him here um, standing in front of his self-portrait in the gallery. This, is, this painting is right across from the general and his sales pitch and the little emperor. This is a, a monumental piece, a large scale self-portrait. And you see Marcus in his studio. And I should say that 
Um, this is in his Fort Myers studio. He has a, a, Ford, uh, a studio in Fort Myers, Florida, and another one in the Bronx. So he's between both places, although because of COVID, he has spent most, most of this year here in Florida. Um, but here he is in his workspace, in his studio. And if you look at him in the painting, he's wearing only shorts. He is, um, he represents himself in his own battlefield, vulnerable, not covered with a uniform, armor, nothing. He is completely exposed and facing the canvas as these new, um, perhaps, combat zone that he enters now um, as a painter. Again, painting is the most intimate act of war, he tells us, right? So this is the way in which he processes his experiences and what he sees happening in the world. And um, the self-portrait is after a famous photograph of him, and I can't remember the name of the photographer, but a, a photograph that was taken of him in the studio wearing his shorts and, and bearing pretty much everything else and, and being um, in the presence of his of his work, his materials. Um, and so the painting is modeled after that. And you can see the table behind him with some of the materials that he's using on top. You can see some other canvases. As I mentioned, he works on several canvases at the same time, leaning against the wall. And he's surveying the studio, the work, the way he works. He surveys the studio. Um, he goes from one canvas to the other looking at um, where he wants to paint next and what he's going to paint. Um, he uh, flips through magazines and newspapers. He is very much in tune with what's being talked about in social media. Um, he flips channels from one network to the other um, to see what's being talked about in the news. So all of these things is almost like this is his new uh, combat zone for him where he has to address what's happening and how he's feeling instead of using um, the means of the military um, and warfare here using creativity, color, brushes, form, and his imagination to create these amazing paintings. Um, so I thought it would be interesting to have him across from the general, across from the little emperor, asserting himself perhaps in this new cycle um, as an alternative figure um, that can uh, provide a different perspective. So here are a few ways that you can experience the exhibition. If you haven't yet, it will be on view until January 3rd. You can visit the museum by reserving a free time ticket on our website, rollins.edu slash CFAM. Um, you can take a 360 tour and uh, on our website of the exhibition, you see it there um, in the center. You can take a, a tour of both galleries and, um, and listen to Marcus uh, give you a welcome and an introduction to the exhibition. There's a recording embedded in the 360 tour. And on the right here, I'm showing you the catalog from which I cited earlier, um, an interview. It includes an interview with the artist and an amazing essay by Dr. Brooklyn McGowan, who um, dives deep into uh, the theory and the art historical background of some of his landscapes. So if you have questions or comments, I'm happy. We have uh, some time to take questions and comments. So Maureen asks, why did you choose this artist? Thank you for that question. So I have known Marcus for about seven years seven, eight years is going to be um, now. And I had one painting by him titled, I remember, Orwellian Infiltrations in a group exhibition of Florida contemporary artists I did years ago at a different museum where I used to work uh, before coming to Rollins. And uh, we established a good working relationship. Um, I visited his studio many times and followed him on social media. And we always stayed in touch and talked about possibilities for creating um, a substantial exhibition that brought together um, a good number of works that uh, could tell a story uh, without necessarily being a retrospective. And so 
things fell into place when I started here at Rollins. It's now two and a half years ago. And, um, and I decided, okay, I think we are, we are ready to present it here at CFAM and, um, and we move forward with it. And it has been an amazing uh, process working with him. And um, also I wanted to recommend if you wanted to know more about Marcus, there's a great documentary that you can watch online. I think you can get it on um, Amazon Prime called um, Examine and Report. Um, that's another way. Um, in which you can see him working, you can hear more from him. Um, and there are interviews with several art historians and critics um, who examine his work. I think with this exhibition, thank you for your comment, Laura, um, about, yes, thank you. Um, I think this exhibition also um, brings an opportunity for viewers to see a lot of his work in one place. This is the first solo museum exhibition that Marcus has in the United States. So it's a first um, in that sense. He has shown extensively in Germany and um, in Italy, in London and other places and has been included in group shows here in the US. But this is the first time an American museum um, uh, brings together a large number of works for an exhibition exclusively of his work. So it's special in that way as well. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much for your comments. I really appreciate it. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your kind works, uh, kind words about um, working in the exhibition during these difficult times. It definitely was a challenge and was interesting also to work uh, behind the scenes to get the exhibition um ready for view when we reopen the museum in september so um thank you so much sarah i hope you enjoy this tour and again if you want to learn more about marcus you can visit his website marcusjansen.com you can take the 360 tour in our website uh, rollins.edu slash cfam uh, you can read the catalog which you can get in the museum store or through amazon if you can't make it to the museum and you can also enjoy an artist talk, an interview with Marcus that we did in October, which you can find also on our YouTube channel. So I hope you enjoy this tour today and we'll see you again very soon. Take care, bye-bye.